that this nation should commit itself to achieving the goal before this decade is out of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to Earth. These words spoken by President John F. Kennedy on May 25th of 1961 accelerated the space race that had begun when the USSR put Sputnik into orbit in 1957. Well, soon after John Kennedy issued this challenge, the president of the American Society of Civil Engineers asked the technical committees throughout the society to study and contribute to solving important issues that would need to be looked at if this goal was to be achieved. At that time, I was a member of the Soil Properties Committee of the Soil Mechanics Division, now the Geo Institute. And I agreed to take a look at what we thought might be awaiting us up there on the moon. And there was a lot of speculation about what the surface material would be. It's called, the soil up there is called regolith by the geologists. But anyhow, there was a lot of speculation ranging from hard rock-like surfaces to thick layers of soft, fluffy stuff, maybe like cigarette ashes, to green cheese. So we speculated about that for a long time. Fortunately, there were a series of um, pre-missions, uh, in a sense, to what ultimately happened, where we learned more. There was a Ranger program, which was a camera on a spacecraft that crashed into the moon, sending back pictures. There was a Lunar Orbiter program, cameras flying around the moon. Then there was the soft-landed surveyor uh, program, which really put a great deal of the information and better focus. Well, as the Apollo launch goal uh, 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 approached, there were a lot of experiments that were developed for the missions, and teams were put together to work on these. And there was a small group of us in soil mechanics, you may uh, know or have known some. First was Nick Costas, who was working with NASA at the Marshall Space Flight Center. Then David Carrier, who was a recent PhD in soil mechanics from MIT, who went to work for NASA in Houston. There was the late Professor Ron Scott, who was at Caltech, and he was involved in the surveyor program and um, did really great work uh, with the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Caltech, with what went on then, and I was involved as well. Um, and so um, we were first we were first a little subgroup within the field geology experiment. Then later on, the four of us were split off as a team, doing what was then called soil mechanics. Apollo 11 landed on the surface of the moon on July 20th of 1969. Neil Armstrong stepped onto the surface, and you all know the first thing that he said. So I'll focus on the second. Here's what he said. The surface is fine and powdery. I can kick it up loosely with my toe. It does it here, here in fine layers, like powdered charcoal to the soles and the inside of my boots. I only go in a small fraction of an inch, maybe an eighth of an inch. But I can see the footprints of my boots and the treads in the fine sandy particles. He'd get good marks in my beginning geotechnical engineering course for what he said then. There were five subsequent successful landings on the lunar surface. And the final one was returning the two astronauts in December of 1972. And the last two astronauts to leave the moon were Gene Cernan 
and Jack Schmidt. Jack Schmidt, or Jack Harrison Schmidt, uh, actually was a geologist. He was the only scientist among the, uh, the, the astronauts that actually landed on the moon. He later became a U.S. Sen uh, senator. Um, well, during the six successful Apollo missions, 12 men walked on the moon. There were 160 man hours of people out on the surface. Six of these people also rode around a little bit. And all that time that they were on the surface, the command module was spinning around in orbit above the moon to collect the astronauts and bring them back to Earth. There were 30,000 photographs. There were some 60 different uh, uh, experiments on the surface, 30 in orbit. They brought back 841 pounds of lunar soil and rocks. And these materials have been studied by some thousand scientists in 19 countries. Well, there were a lot of experiments going on during that period while they were up there. Seismology, magnetometers, solar wind measurements, geology experiment, laser ranging retroreflector, cosmic ray measurements, close-up surface camera, and we had a soil mechanics. It was called the soil mechanics experiment. The purpose was to determine the physical and mechanical properties of the lunar surface and their variation laterally and with depth. And we had several data sources that we drew on to get the information that we needed to do this. Pre-Apollo, of course, there was whatever we could dream up as was the likely character up there. We had these other programs that went on before the actual landing. We did tests using lunar soil simulants, was usually some form of ground up basalt. And whatever we could deduce by considering that we were in a one-sixth gravity field, there was no atmosphere, there was no water, um, it was cold in the lunar night, minus uh, 153 degrees C, and it was very hot when the sun was shining on the surface of the moon, about 107 degrees C. But on the moon, there were a number of experiments that were going on, as I've already indicated. And during the Apollo missions themselves, whatever the astronauts did, wherever they went, and whatever they did when they got there, was strictly defined, rehearsed, studied in great detail before they ever left the Earth. And so these extravehicular activities called EVAs were where they did all the sampling, testing, exploration on the surface, and all that sort of thing. And from our perspective, we benefited by many photographs, uh, what we later learned from classification tests in soil, mechanical analyses. They drew core tube samples. They dug a trench for us. And we had a couple of penetrometers in the later missions. This is a photograph of the vehicle that was used during Apollo's uh, 15, 16, 17 uh, to try to drive them around and let them do their work. And we had a couple of penetrometers before we were finished. One was just simply staff. You held it in your arm and pushed it in the ground. But the other was a little uh, more sensitive and accurate device which was a little cone penetrometer that was pushed into the surface of the moon, and they returned data that was recorded on a drum. And uh, this uh, gave us some quantitative information about the penetration. Well, having done these things and looked at samples and so on, what is the lunar soil? What is up there? Well, the soil covers the surface in depths of, say, more, a few centimeters all the way up to 20 meters or more. The dominant mechanism for creating it is meteorite impact. The particles consist of rock fragments, mineral grains, glass-like things, uh, breccias, and some frothy materials that they called 
uh, agglutinates. There are even some little glass spheres found at some of the sites. Interestingly, the mineralogy of this material, though, is nothing like terrestrial soils, where we have lots of quartz and feldspar and so on. Up there, it's, it's, it's more um, the darker igneous rocks from volcanic materials and that sort of thing. And so it's very quite, uh, very quite different than here. Basically, it classifies as a broadly graded, silty fine sand silty, fine, sandy material, SM or MO, ML in the Unified Soil Classification System. What are the properties? Well, there's a variable density from one to two grams per uh, cubic centimeter. Uh, the density and the strength increase with depth very noticeably. There's a little bit of cohesion of that stuff up there, maybe uh, 0.1 to one uh, kilonewton uh, per square meter. The friction angle depends most on how dense the soil is, and it's reg been measured to be in the range of, say, 30 to 50 degrees. Obviously, the density controls the strength. It's less dense and weaker on slopes and crater rims. Up there, there's maybe 100 different minerals that people have identified. Here on Earth, there's a uh, several thousand on Earth that have been identified. Um, the narrower range of properties up there is in part due to the fact that it's a quite different uh, situation. There's no water, there's no atmosphere, there's no organics. So that's what we learned about the moon. What about Mars? There are different soil forming processes up on Mars. Um, there's volcanic and there's tectonic activities up there. Uh, there are some cratering from impacts. There's some hydro generated things because there has been water in eons past. And the properties up on Mars have been deduced from, from uh, photographs, from interactions of landers and, and rovers with the surface, remote surface uh, sampling measurements, and uh, uh, of, of some vehicles that they've had up there doing, doing work and interactions between what they were doing and, and the surface of, of Mars. And it's, it's like, like a moderately dense earth soil, such as a clay silt uh, and, and with some sands and, and uh, granular material and pebbles. The most recent landing on Mars was in November of last year, this InSight mission. And the InSight mission is de designed to learn two things primarily, about the seismicity and about the thermal properties of the material. They're capable of drilling to a depth of about 16 feet up there. And they have two primary instruments that work up there, and that mission is still going on. So where do we stand uh, with respect to geotechnical engineering on the moon and Mars? I think the knowledge of things on the moon is pretty good now. Silty fine sand increasing relative density with depth. And, uh, and, and we, we know about its compressibility. We know about its strength and, and, and those types of things. On Mars, it's, it's more variable, it's less understood, but we still have a pretty good idea that it's got some pretty good supporting capacity and so on. And a char characteristic of both environments, the Moon and Mars, is there is dust, and the dust has caused a lot of problems. We concluded that the surface of the Moon and Mars are capable of supporting vehicles and structures of various types that are envisioned for the next generation of exploration in those uh, remote locations. And you can conclude, I think, that were it not for the harsh environmental conditions, in addition to the great distances and their impacts on material transport and communications, 
For example, it takes from four minutes to 24 minutes for the signal to transit between Mars and Earth, depending on how far the two bodies are apart at any given time. But if a word for that, um, pretty straightforward geotechnical engineering, you can conclude. Of course, those are big obstacles to overcome. Well, what's next? Uh, NASA with, with uh, uh, commercial and international participation plans to launch robotic lunar uh, missions in early, as early as 2020. The focus is on standing, understanding of lunar resources and preparation for sustained human presence up there. They're going to launch from NASA's uh, modernized spaceport at Kennedy Space Center using a new heavy rocket uh, that's called the Space Launch System. And flights with astronauts are uh, being planned for as, as soon as the early 2020s. So that's a very, very brief uh, uh, overview of what's been going on up there. And uh, if you think about it, it's a good time to begin celebrating the 50th anniversary of the first lunar landing because that's coming up on July 20th of this year. Thank you.